So, Cheryl, thank you for, uh, for, for me finally being able to uh, get you on the program. Cheryl has been uh, uh, known to my family now for actually maybe five years or more. Uh, uh, Cheryl's son, Sean, was a very good friend with and our son, Curran, uh, for a couple of years. And that's when we first met. Cheryl's story is, uh, is, um, it has to be heard and proud to have her on, and uh, the organization that she has created and represents uh, needs to be known. Having the opioid epidemic and addiction in general uh, described from her perspective uh, and with her experience will help you, the audience, better relay and understand what the real challenges are and sometimes what the misunderstandings of it are. So uh, with that said, Cheryl, uh, thank you and uh, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. If you may, just uh, can you just uh, quickly introduce yourself to the audience? Um, my name is Cheryl Jouer. Yeah, you live in uh, Massachusetts, Central Mass. Okay, so, you want more? okay. so I live. <laughs> yeah, I, I live in Marlboro, Massachusetts. I'm a mother to three boys: Bobby, Sean, and Corey. Um, Bobby's. Uh, police officer in Hudson, Massachusetts, and um, my other two children, I say, um, when people ask how many children you have, I usually say I have three, one with feet and two with wings. Uh, you are the, uh, how would I best describe it, the founder and CEO of an organization called Team Sharing in Inc., is that correct? Sure. Correct. Uh, yep. And how would you describe, uh, how would you introduce Team Sharing Inc. Uh, to the uh, to the audience? Uh, we're a national nonprofit organization based here in Massachusetts because that's where I live. Uh, we're an organization of parents who have all lost our children from uh, substance use disorder. Uh, broadly speaking, it's because uh, 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 although uh, opioids and synthetic opioids are the uh, the most uh, deadliest things today, uh, there are uh, parents who've lost children from other substances as well that are represented. Yes. Oh, yes. It's, it's from everything. It's even, we even, you know, it's suicide. Anything to do with any kind of addiction-related uh, death. And we support people um, all across the country. If uh, somebody's lost a child, we reach out to them. And um, and we do our best to to support them in any way we can. Uh, do you have chapters across the country? We do have chapters. You can find them on our website, teamsharinginc.org. Uh, and there's no no spaces or hyphens in there. No, no. Could you give us a background on how team sharing started? Sure. So my son Corey. Uh, died February 24th, 2011. Uh, Corey dabbled in drugs, um, but I thought it was, uh, um, I thought it was a choice that he made. And I thought it was a normal thing because what kids in high school don't try something. I tried something when I was in high school, but then I got married and had kids. And, and so I just stopped. Um, I knew nothing about addiction. I knew nothing about opioids. I, I knew nothing. So Corey did try to come to me and, and explain to me, but I thought because he was my third child and he was my baby boy, that maybe he was just a little bit spoiled and maybe a lot spoiled. Um, and so I, I, I thought it was a choice and, and uh, you know, he chose to be on food stamps. He chose to live in, um, you know, sober living houses and stuff. And I, I would be like, Corey, what are you doing? I didn't raise my kids that way. You know, um, same mom, same dad. I didn't, I didn't understand it. And then, um, and then on February 24th, 2011, I got the phone call that my son overdosed from a heroin overdose. And I, I, it brought me to my knees and I was living in Florida at the time. He was in Massachusetts. He was actually supposed to take a plane down the very next day to spend a week with me because he was going through some issues with his girlfriend. Um, he was a dad. He had a four and a half month old daughter. So he was, he was going through a little bit of trials. He was on probation. 
he had to get papers signed from the courts and the judge to let him leave the states. Um, he just had a few more months to go of probation and then he was good and he was good to go. But they did, they approved him to go, come to uh, Florida and um, I was uh, calling him the day before and calling him and calling him actually that evening um, to make sure that he had a right to the airport uh, because he didn't have his license and uh, there was no, no answer. So I eventually called my oldest son, the police officer who called the town of Arlington that Corey was living in and they went and did a wellness check and they, they found him. Um, of course, they went back and told my oldest son who then had to call me and tell me that news. And that's when, uh, that was probably one of the hardest things I've ever heard in my life is mom, Corey's dead. Um, and I'll never forget that night bringing me to my knees. So we took the airplane ticket that he was supposed to fly down with and flew back to Massachusetts. We buried him and I had to get right back to work because I owned a business. And that was, uh, that was really, really, really difficult. But every three months I was flying up to Massachusetts just to spend time at his grave. I needed to be close to his bones. And I would just, um, I belonged to a great church, but they knew nobody that had lost a child, let alone to addiction. So nobody spoke of Corey. Nobody knew what to do with me. So I just functioned every day. I woke up, I cried. I went to bed, I cried. I cried most of the day for the next three years. I suffered in my grief. And, and I tell people, how it, I can't express it enough when I say I suffered in my grief because I was alone. I had nobody to talk to. I had nobody that understood. I wanted to die, but I didn't want to kill myself, but I just didn't want to live with that pain and I didn't know how to make it go away. We finally decided to move back to Massachusetts because I needed to be near my son. And we did, we moved back to Massachusetts and I was, um, I was scrolling uh, some Facebook pages looking uh, for some sort of anything, I guess, support. And I came across some moms that had lost their child to addiction. And there was seven of, of us here in Massachusetts that agreed to go meet for dinner one night. And so we did. Actually, I got a, I got a um, text message out of the blue that said, hey, you don't know me, but I'm a mom. I didn't even know what that meant. And... Um, there's a bunch of us that are going to meet for the first time at this restaurant. And um, I know it's last minute. It's tomorrow night. If you can make it, you know, we'd love to have you. And I just told my, I remember telling my husband, I just feel like this is someplace I need to be. And it was an hour away. And I don't know who I was meeting, but I just felt it was someplace I needed to be. And so what happened was there was seven of us moms and we were sitting around a table and we had all lost our child to an overdose. And we shared our stories. We, we closed the restaurant that night. And there was a point when um, somebody said, you know, I feel like I wanted to die. I don't want to kill myself. I just don't want to live with this pain anymore. And I was like, oh my God, I feel that way too. And somebody else said, I feel that way. I feel that way. And as we were going around and sharing our stories, they were so similar. And I knew I was going to be okay. I was okay. I didn't know that before I got there because I thought somebody, I'm just a mess. I, and I didn't know how to fix me. And this was the beginning of, of my fix, if you want to call it that. And so we, we kept, um, I went home that night and I was on cloud nine and I just felt like God, you just did this for, for a reason. And so I created a messenger in Facebook and I put us all in there and we blew it up. We were just like 24 seven. There was always somebody on this messenger. We were always talking and we were always sharing. And this was in um, August of 2015. And that same year in October, they had the fed up rally down in Washington, DC. And I heard about it. And I said to these other six months, Hey, there's a fed up rally down in 
Washington, you guys want to go? Next thing you know, we all booked our flights. We shared hotel rooms. The seven of us were down in Washington, D.C. at this big fed up rally. And, and um, so from there, down there, met other parents from Massachusetts that had lost kids. And so I'm like, what do I do now? And I, cause I didn't want to lose that momentum of, of healing, of feeling joy for the first time in my life. And so I created a Facebook page and it was just a page for us all to go to because I found these people in groups that had children with an active addiction. We didn't belong there. We no longer belong there, but we had no place to go. So I started the, um, this group and it wasn't called team sharing by no means. It was called sharing your child's loss from substance passing in Massachusetts. I mean, I was one big long, but it was a place that we could all grow and uh, go. And we were, we were um, one by one by one people were coming in. Now the biggest, the biggest thing I learned that first night was that over time, people forgot our child's birthdays and the date they died. And that was the biggest thing that we griped about that night is that our own family, our own friends, number one, many deserted us because they didn't know how to handle us, but nobody remembered those dates. So as the years go by, they forget. That's when our child dies, that's the first day of the rest of our lives now. So I said, when you join this group, this was just, you know, for the few of us, you're going to have to give with, you don't have to, but I would suggest that you give me your child's name, date of birth, and date of death. Because on those days, we won't forget. In this group, we won't forget. Little did I know that there was going to be 900 people in Massachusetts team sharing, but we do do it. We still do it. I used to get up at five o'clock in the morning just to make sure that it was posted before the mom even woke up. Wow. And um, now we have to do multiple posts and they were, they're, they're okay with that. But, um, but that's, that's how we started. And then um, people heard of us and they started reaching out from other different States. And I kind of didn't really, I, I never said no, but I kind of didn't really want that because in Massachusetts, what we did was we didn't just meet that once for dinner. We met at, an, at a mom's house for a cookout. We went bowling. We went to the movies. Anybody that was that wanted to, we went places. We did things together. And we were all starting to heal. We were all starting to find joy together. And so I did let those folks in. but And I said, God, I thought this plan was just for Massachusetts. And so I felt he said, no, you're going it, to, it's going to be bigger than that. Because we had to help these parents because there's nothing worse than losing a child and having nobody to talk to. So we started, I started opening different chapters. I made sure that I had an admin to run those chapters because we don't belong in that state, let's say Pennsylvania. And I had to make sure that they were okay, that they were mentally okay stable enough to do it and god just led everybody um that way so that so that's that's basically how that all gets started and what what, what we all do in all the different states is is we just we just um we get together we just share our love together and and it's like when you meet a grieving parent it's like you've just met your best friend for the first time now I, I I understand team sharing. It's sharing the experience. And what what, what is, and perhaps it's both, uh, or perhaps they're equal. What, what, what's a greater relief to finally have someone to talk to or someone that you can actually listen to with a similar experience? It, it is both. And um, I just, because um, I've lost two children, I... I've started up a, a, another group for loss of two or more. And we have 60 members in there right now. And quite a few of them are from Massachusetts. 
And so um, there's there's a mom who just recently lost her second one, and she's she undoubtedly is a hot mess. And I've met her a few times at different events, but I called her up and I said, Mary, let's go out and do coffee. Let's go have, you know, and she hadn't been out of her house since her son died. So we did, we went out, we sat there for about three hours and we just chatted, we had coffee, we were outside. She said this was the first time she had taken a shower since since her son died. And that was to go, to go out. Um, and we just shared, you know, I shared my loss from Sean, my second one, and she le- shared her loss. She shared both of them with me because I didn't know them. And that brought her great joy because the next day I got this unbelievable message about how much I helped her. And, you know, so I, I tell people a lot of times, you got to understand I, I'm really selfish because helping you helps me. You know, so um, so call me selfish, and, and and that's okay. But um, but that's what we do for each other. And um, and I'll just share quickly that you know when when Corey died, I didn't have anybody. Um, at a, barely at his funeral, I like I said knew nobody that had lost a child, let alone to addiction. And then um, when I lost Sean, um, ten years later, at the the, the, the minute people heard that I had lost Sean, moms, they were at my house. They brought food. They brought coffee. They made sure I ate. They made sure I slept. They made sure my house was clean. These are all parents that have lost children. They were there. When at Sean's wake, he was, they were all, they all sat back in the corner watching me. They were just, they were chatting and, the, and they were watching me to make sure I was okay because they'd been there with their first, so they knew, you know? And so I asked them all afterwards, I said, why did you guys do that? Like, especially when you just, you know, you've all lost, you know? And they said, Cheryl, you've done this for us Mm -hmm. and you don't even know it. And we're giving back to you now when you need it. And um, so it was only a few days after that I went back to work because I was able to, because I had so much support that I, would, I knew I was going to be okay, even after losing two kids. If I may. Um, actually, Sean has been on my bookshelf. Uh, I <laughs> shared Sean's story with the, uh, my audience here. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, our son Kearns, one of his best years uh, was when he was a very good friend of Sean. Sean was a, uh, uh, they met at, Teen Challenge group in Brockton. Brockton. And Sean, uh, I didn't know his background at the time, but he he knew how to grow business. He knew engagement strategies. He knew how to sell. And I think that they had a blockbuster year. And Curran too. You know, Curran could have been uh that, you know, that 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 guy at the tech company that makes a fortune in commissions. He had it. He just had a few more challenges than he could handle, uh, but uh, thanks to Sean, I would say I, we 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 knew, but we we could really see Curran's own potential. And Sean was, he, I, I loved him, I loved him. I'm so sorry, but he's been with our audience actually for since the day he passed. Um, uh, we went to the service, uh, so for many of the of, of the of the parents in your organization. Um, for some uh, lose children, and their uh, uh, their children perhaps were extremely young uh, and did not have children of their own. But many do, and then you have this. Uh, I wish it was not a growing population, but a population of parents that have to go on as being part parents, part grandparents in a way. So it's right. uh, and so that continues on. Um, and that was the case with both Corey and Sean. They both had children. Is there anything about uh, 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 that you'd like to share, that experience or, or the challenges? Of them having children? Yes, that's another dimension of this. Uh, there's, uh, there's people needing to support themselves, of course, so they can go on. 
Uh, right. But it's not as if their families are over. There's other siblings that still need right. to be, you know, sometimes get through college, grow up. And then there's yep. uh, uh, grandchildren now that have that will impact their whole lives. So part of team sharing is is also you got to get back on your feet. You still got a lot of work to do. Right. Addiction affects everybody, but it really, really um, the kids left behind is is where my heart really lies um, because they're, they're the up and coming generation and we want to make sure that they don't do what their parents did. And a lot of the, you know, a lot of addiction, you know, started with the doctors and medical and, mm-hmm. and whatnot. But once they took that pill that filled a void of some pain or or whatever reason it was that they got addicted to, that could happen again to the children because they're in pain because they've lost a parent. And we don't want to see that happen again. Um, Every year we have a Christmas party um, for team sharing. We call it for the children left behind. And we do it here in Massachusetts. And we have about 50 children and the grandparents bring the children and um, we we ask um, for the gift. So we ask the grandparent. They have like a hundred dollar limit. It's one big gift, and maybe something that their mom or their dad might have bought for them that they can't get now because they're no longer here. A pair of Nike sneakers, uh, a hoverboard, um, a drone. Like we've bought all these things that these kids have requested. And the joy that comes from them that day, seeing Santa Claus coming out on a fire truck and and having lunch and face painting and, and a balloon maker and we just we just go all out and it's it's again selfishly it's really a joy for me to see all this happen. But we don't just do this in Massachusetts. So we I take the national chapter and I announce in that chapter if you have a child who passed, who had a child or children, we want to give them gifts. And I thank God for Amazon because they fill out an application and um, and then I I ship the gifts and I ship them to the grandparents and it's up to them to wrap them and up to them to give them the gift. But I ask that they take a picture or, um, or a video or something to, so that we can see the joy that these children are sharing and, and, and it's, it's just, it's wonderful. It's really wonderful. Uh, if I may, can I ask a question about, I mean, there's, we have a wide range. We have a, uh, a large and diverse audience. Not everyone is aware of the, of the, of the, of the challenges of, uh, modern drugs and, uh, addiction. Um, you know, we're all, we all go through a phase where we're young, and we do some stupid things um, yeah. and, uh, you know, rebel a little bit here or there. And um, something has has changed, though. The the nature of the of the drugs which are available right now, I believe I describe it to my audience mm-hmm. as um, there was a, a lot of depression and anxiety and addiction at the end of Vietnam, heroin addiction. Um, but. Many of the returning troops found their way through that. There was a, there was a lot of loss, but most were able to beat it. But do you ever have to go through this discussion as part of your political activism, trying to raise awareness of what we're dealing with today? This is different. This just goes to a level of addiction that is it, it, most people just don't know until they're there, and then it might already be too late. How would you? So I've come across. I came across so many parents that before this Purdue Sackler thing all came about, said, you know, I gave my child an Oxycontin or a Percocet when they had their teeth out. And they just kept doing drugs afterwards and then they died. These parents didn't understand about addiction. And, um, and so, One day, um, when our Attorney General, Maura Healy, 
was speaking on the Sacklers. I had no idea even who they were and what they had done. I downloaded a copy of the complaint. And when I read that complaint, I was like, oh my God, this is it. All Everything I'd heard from these parents talking, I mean, yeah, we went out, we did parties and we did this and that, but there was always, my child died. Why did my child die? How did my child die? And it was nothing that we just put two and two together until I read this complaint. And it just made sense. So really, really what happened is Arthur Sackler from the Sackler family, he was a psychiatrist and he was a, a, a marketer for pharm pharmaceuticals way back like in the 60s. He marketed Valium and he made he made that company um, their first hundred million dollars. And he was a genius at it. And so what happened from there was other companies followed the way he marketed. And when he marketed, it was not a, this drug is not addicting or they'd market, you know, they'd give you hats and pens and vacations and, and all that stuff. But now Oxycontin came about after he was gone, but the marketing stayed within the within the family. The marketing stayed with all the pharmaceuticals. They got it. They all wanted to make money because it's all about making money, right? So even, you know, Percocet, when kids get their playing sports in high school and broke their elbow, they got a Percocet or they got an Oxycontin, they got a pain pill. Now, while these people that like the Sacklers hired, Purdue hired to go out into to all these doctor's offices and convince them that these aren't addicting. And if they are showing signs of withdrawal, it's only because they need it more. They need a higher dose. And so just widespread across this country, that's really what happened. Now, not, now, now it's fentanyl, of course, you know, but that's where it all started. And um, so I reached out to Maura Haley and um, she she had a family advisory council and I'm still on it with the new attorney general. Um, you'll find that, or I have found that parents that have lost a child are the biggest warriors you'll ever, you'll ever have. We've got the biggest voices and we will go out there and we will shout and we will scream and we will make a difference. Um, I had a chance um, to go to New York City, and there was the Purdue bankruptcy that was going on, mm -hmm. and um, I was invited to go out and try to be on the Unsecured Creditors Committee for the Purdue bankruptcy, and my goal was just to bring them down. That was my goal. That was all the state's goals was to, to bring them down, bring them out of business, put them in jail, lock them with the key, and throw it away. Um, and so I was in a courthouse with hundreds of people that wanted a, this, a seat on this uh, committee. And there were nine seats available. Um, I was the ninth one called. I was able to get on this committee. And my thought process at that point was, yes, I have a seat at the table. I am going to bring them down. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, unfortunately, that's not how the bank bankruptcy system works. Uh, we're still in negotiations almost four years later, but a lot has changed. A lot has changed. Uh, regarding uh, that trial, they, uh, has there at least been a ruling of guilt? And now it's, a, now it's down to settlement or what's the current status of that? So after the bankruptcy was confirmed, um, it went to appeal. And this judge, the, the, the second judge, it was being appealed because third-party non-consensual releases. Um, the judges weren't sure if, if those were legal. So they wanted the second circuit to take this and uh, come out with a, a verdict of whether, whether it was legal or not. Now, it's been legal for years. While it sat in the Second Circuit, 
It sat there for 13 months before they came back with a decision. And the decision was, yes, it is legal, which means we can proceed now to the next step. Now, the next step could be, you know, let's let's get this money rolling out and all the stuff that they have to do. Or the Department of Justice has so much time to get it uh, to file another repeal and it'll go to the Supreme Court. Now, this third party non-consensual releases, everybody's saying, well, Sacklers get a free pass and, and the Sacklers are off in, 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 in this and that. Well, this didn't apply just to the Sacklers. This was an over, overall ruling for the bankruptcy courts. And it's not necessarily a bad thing because it's been used for good reasons in the bankruptcy courts. However, there is a, um, a criminal case against Purdue, but part of the release to get the $6 billion out of the Sacklers was that nobody could sue them civilly. So the public can't go ahead and, and, and file a claim because claims have already been taken care of in this suit. Um, however, the states and the government can go after them criminally. So that's not part of the deal. So a, a lot of people get upset saying they, they got off scot-free, they're walking away. That's not necessarily true. The, 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 the government can go after them criminally. Civilly, we cannot. Is, has something happened as part of the, the system so far that would uh, give a company pause or an individual pause to pursue these practices again, or are we still at risk? I think we'll always be at risk. However, um, if the DOJ lets up and lets the DEA do their work, then, um, and not take it away from them like they did, um, then we can make these ph pharmaceutical companies and distributors accountable. We can hold them accountable. And I think that's kind of where they're at now. Um, I believe, I'm not sure of what the company was, but I believe they just pulled somebody's license mm -hmm. because they continued to um, send pills out to areas that didn't need them. Uh, diversion is what it's called. And... Um, and they pulled their license and uh, you know, the Wait, company's like, the company's called diversion. No, no. The, oh, I'm like, no, what, no. what an appropriate diversion. name company. <laughs> oh no, 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 no. Diversion Mc, is where, McKesson? where they send pill. McKesson for a while. was. Well, so McKesson. This is, this is a company, okay. a small company that I hadn't heard of. It's just, it's been in the news recently. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, but they, I mean, they're, they're, they're slapping fines They're They're paying attention now. I mean, this, this epidemic is, I, I don't think there's anybody that has not heard of this epidemic. So there, there's many people who are doing their best to be, uh, to stay on top of the news cycle and follow the most uh, important and impactful events of our time. But if you look at, uh, regardless of your political disposition, and, and even though the demographic impact has been catastrophic, it still is seldom a top story. Is it because it, it's it's actively being uh, suppressed? Why, why why do you think why do you think that is? What what's your uh, what have you observed? And if you, is there anything you care to speculate about there? Because I'm just I'm still shocked. Yeah. So I I think it's a stigma. I I I really think it's a stigma. And if you look at the politicians. Um, those that haven't been affected by it, they just want to sweep it under the rug and it's not there. Um, until they've been affected or know somebody, that's when they're coming out and that's when they're they're wanting to do something. But, but again, it's so political, it's not even funny and it doesn't matter what party. It, it's, it, it's political. Um, but a lot of, a lot of that is with, with the stigma. And that's everywhere. That's, you know, I find it hard to believe because I live in the world of addiction. I live in the world of recovery. I live in the world mm. of grief. I live there. So I don't see stigma in there, you know, but you go outside of your little box there 
and you stop meeting people that have nothing to do with addiction or maybe they've heard about it, but they're going to still call our kids junkies and they deserved it. And, you know, you're still going to get that. And I'm like, I'm blown away. I'm like, okay, like 10 years later and we're still hearing that. So it's not a priority. Um, you know, guns are a priority, you know, and we've had more deaths from overdose than from gun shootings. And I don't know what it's going to take to make this a priority. But I do have to say that all these lawsuits against all these companies, the agreements have been all this money has to go towards abatement. All this money, so unlike the tobacco, big tobacco, right, where the money just went to golf courses and wherever they, the states felt like they wanted to spend it, hmm. every penny of this money has to go towards abatement. It has to go to help um, people in, in recovery. I mean, there's a, there's a whole uh, term sheet on where this money can be spent to help people. And so that's a really, really good thing. Um, the thing is, Purdue's money hasn't started trickling in because it's still, it's still in um, the appeal process and all that. But um, all these other companies, money's coming in, into the states already. Money's coming into the cities and towns. Now, what's happening with that is a lot of people are saying they've got the money and they're like, well, we don't know what to do with it. So the money's here to help people. And so... Um, in Massachusetts is an opioid recovery and remediation fund advisory con council. People need to look that up, see who's on that council. So that's the council for the state and then see what it is that you need to do in your town. And this is really, really, really important in Massachusetts because every town is getting money. They're getting funds from all these different uh, pharmaceutical companies to help with overdose. Somebody's got to take the initiative and call their their uh, their mayor, their town counselor, whoever, and or mostly the health department, and and just say, how much money did we get, and what are we doing with that money? Because now we have to hold them accountable. Because if not, that money's just going to sit there, and nothing's going to happen. It's also been suggested, like let's just say Marlboro. I don't know what, what the statistics are in Marlboro, but Worcester's really bad. So we could take our money and join it with Worcester. We can do that. That's that, that's okay to do. I remember the judge specifically saying, you can't take this money to hospitals and buy an x-ray machine. This money has to be used to help save lives. And so the victims in the Purdue case only got $750 million. The victims totally. that have uh, and, totally, and, that's going to be split between everybody. Those families that have lost their loved ones, that, that have lost their homes, that have lost their 401ks, that mortgaged everything, that went to these fake recovery houses and, that, and had to pay $20,000 a month to to but we can save your child, which no, they can't save, you know. And so I've met so many parents that have lost everything and they've filed suit and they were, the victims were really at the bottom of the list. I was, I was okay with that. And the reason I was okay with that for me, for my money, was that this all that money has to be used to save somebody's life got to be used towards abatement and i was okay with that if i get something well and good but the rest of that money needs to help save lives and it can people just need to know what to do with it uh i listened to the town of southboro which is next to marlboro uh health health department uh webcasts they broadcast them and there's only a few people like five or ten people that ever listen to them i don't listen to all of them i've never heard them bring up this fund but i might have missed it uh but i'll need to ask uh, around um uh, every town has money every and it has to go into a special fund used just for abatement every town 
So thank you. Yeah, that's a misunderstanding. I, I wasn't aware of that uh, myself. I was thinking it was mostly going to victims. And um, I mean, I, I've, uh, you know, there's this, there's these tragic accidents of 14 year olds who go to a party and smoke a joint that has fentanyl in it and, and have died. This has happened before. I, I've been begging our representative uh, to uh, to have an initiative to just raise awareness of the, you know just tell your kids to be really careful of just the repressed pills, okay? Right. You know, just at least of, if you can just get that little percentage helped, that's a start. So, so that campaign's called "One Pill Can Kill." One pill can kill. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Because now. In high school, like like I had mentioned earlier, you know, when you when you you know you took a pill, you you took some speed or took some acid or whatever, it wasn't addicting, or you didn't have to worry about what was in it, even though it was a street, it wasn't available at the time. Um, I I met a friend. Um, she lives in Texas, and she's out there advocating all the time, but she lost her son Joshua, to one pill. He was 14 years old. She posts, oh my goodness, she posts, this boy, boy, was a curly-haired, beautiful boy, and he did ever. I mean, they had, they had everything. They had the pool. She had the pool parties with all his friends, him jumping in the pool, um, jet skiing. I mean, this kid wanted for nothing. He was probably, and that was their only child. So the probably the happiest kid I've ever seen. And naturally this mom is devastating, but she's out there. She's amazing. She's out there advocating all the time. This one pill can kill, but the DEA knows that. And here we go with the borders, you know, um, all this, uh, you, you know, all this fentanyl coming in now. Um, and I just want to say real quick about the fentanyl. <clears throat> the DEA explained it like this. Because you can have four people get a bag of pills with fentanyl in it, and three survive and one doesn't. And nobody understands why. And the DEA explained it's like a, making a batch of chocolate chip cookies. Yes. So you're putting the chocolate chips in there, you're mixing it all up. You know, they go. it's going in the pill press. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, when you get a cookie, they're all... One has three chocolate chips. This one has 12 chocolate chips. They all have different amounts. You don't know when you're getting something from a batch because they do the same thing when they mix it up. And they don't know how much, you know, of, of that fentanyl goes in this pill versus this pill. So these kids have to be educated. We have to get out there more into the schools and, and explain to them how one pill could kill like this isn't even funny anymore because you're playing Russian roulette with every time you take a pill. And I think many people, they, they, uh, they associate this with um, the war against drugs in the Reagan administration. You know, yeah. this is your dry brain. This is your brain on drugs. And um, uh, there's many parents who, again, you, you, you experimented when you were a kid and they just can't understand. Well, you know, I did some recreational stuff and I turned out okay. And the, the one drug campaign, if because a child or they'll go to a party or a rave and you'll see, oh, a perfect pill. And maybe it comes in a little bag. And, well, it must have been made by a professional. There's no way this one could have 10 times the fentanyl of that one over there. Uh, now we have to, you know, reconcile these well, uh, you know, right. people's current understanding from when they were kids, I didn't know that there was an active campaign for it. And that's good because now uh, when I call Catherine Clark, I can refer to that. I'm sure she's aware. I don't know where, where you stand politically because you work with any party that is in any office. And that is Correct. that's great. Um, so whether it was uh, 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 Moore Healy, who now is the uh, governor of the state of uh, Massachusetts, or um, uh, I saw some, uh, uh, you, you, tr you approached uh, uh, Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions. Is that something you could just speak to, characterize your, you know, your meeting and 
uh, what went well and what didn't there? Expectations, well, Jeff, not expectations? Jeff Sessions was at a, um, a summit in New Hampshire um, put on by the Mark Wahlberg Youth Foundation. Mm -hmm. And um, a bunch of us moms got to go on stage with pictures of our kids. And back then I just had Corey. But I was also backstage. And when Jeff Sessions got off stage, I quickly went over with all his uh, security. But he grabbed my hand. <clears throat> And, um, and we, of course, we're talking about the opioid epidemic. And he looked at me in the face and he promised me that he was going to do everything in his power to help end this crisis. And, you know, I believed him. I mean, that's, that's all you can do is believe him. And I, and I thanked him for his, his honesty. Um, and shortly thereafter, he was cut. So so much for that. But, um, you know, I um, I was on two of more Healy's press conferences. And one, the, the first one was about, um, you know, Purdue and how everybody finally came into agreement because, it, you know, there were a lot of people that just wanted the Sacklers in jail. They didn't want the money. They wanted the Sacklers in jail. But what really made sense was to get their money so we could start saving lives. And so when the states finally all agreed, Maura Healy being one of them, she had a press conference and, and, and announced that. And I was there as well. I had just lost Sean, I think, at that one. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so we all came on board. Um, Anyways, I'm on, I'm I'm on her task force, and um, I asked um, when she was running for governor. I was at one of her fundraising campaigns, and I know her, and and I know how she feels about this opioid epidemic, and and you know I I was on many zooms with her and Purdue and all that as we were finalizing details and, and whatnot. But one of the things I've worked really, really hard on over the years is trying to get our flags lowered to half staff mm -hmm. on August 31st, International Overdose Awareness Day. To have those flags lowered to half staff on that one day of the year to recognize all those families that have lost children or lost loved ones would be so healing for so many. We have about 50 vid vigils across Massachusetts. Um, and everybody's off doing their own thing in their own, own little area. But if we could just have the state without stigma, just lower the flag to half staff on that one day would just be amazing. Now the past governor uh, came back with a no for the last three years. I got a proclamation from them but to lower the flag, no. Oh. I had contacted Washington, the Veterans Administration, and asked them if the governor had the authority to do that, to allow it, and they said yes. Um, we worked with other states. Um, Tennessee lowered the flag when Charlie Daniels died. There were five states that lowered the flag when George Floyd died. So we knew that it could be done. So we're saying something simple just on this one day, just lower it to half black, uh, half staff. Um, we had campaigns in all our different states. So we had Kentucky, Oklahoma, Connecticut. We had many, many states do that for us. And it was wonderful. It was, one, it was on the news, newspaper articles, because that's how we're going to end the stigma too. You know, the conversations. Um, so I ran into Maura Healy and... Um, at a fundraiser, and I said, Maura, when you become, or Attorney General, when you become governor, and she kind of like chuckled, and I said, no, you know you are, but when you become governor, I said, will you lower the flag to half staff on August 31st 
International Overdose Day for all these families that have lost their loved ones. She said, of course I will. She said, why wasn't it done before? Is really the question she asked. And I said, well, I don't want to get into that, but I just need to know if you will. And um, she said, absolutely. Okay, so now it comes. It's almost July and I can't get an answer. Now that she's a governor, I'm emailing everybody that I possibly can. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get a sit down meeting with her and I'm not getting that answer. And I'm not happy because I know what she said. And, you know, I've kind of, I wanted to create a one time big event in Massachusetts at the State House on August 31st for the families. One vigil, not 50 vigils, but that's going to take a lot of planning. And I don't know if I could do that now in two months. I started asking back in January for permission so I could. I almost secured Gillette Stadium. They told me I could at a price, but I couldn't give them an answer because I didn't know if it was going to happen or if I could get her there. Now, you know, she's she supported um, the victims all along with her advisory council and, you know, her, her position as attorney general and, and all that. And I'd hate to think now that she's governor, that that's not a priority for her anymore. And that's sad. That's sad because it's not talked about. Although it was talked about the other day because of those opioid prevention centers and the numbers that came out for the overdose deaths in Massachusetts in 2022. Uh, those numbers were released in what, recently? Last Thursday. Last Thursday. Last Thursday. As a matter of fact, we were at the State House and we were. Um, talking to the legislatures. We had room 222. Um, we packed room of, uh, of advocates for opioid prevention centers. But as we were there, we got the numbers. Um, 2,357 overdose deaths in Massachusetts in 2022. Two and a half percent increase from the year before. It's not going down. I, I didn't know. It had uh, it gone up. I uh, the state of Massachusetts has a report that it releases mm -hmm. um, uh, online. I think it's updated every month or so, um, and uh, I've used that as to to show historically how the number has changed since Corey even. Um, it's it's no it's it's not a victory to say it stabilized at a record number. That's been uh, nope. uh, to, nope. to say, hey, it's it's no longer going up. Well, it's if it's that was at a record level the previous year, that's that's a tragedy. It's still a horrible tragedy. It is. It is. It is. <sighs> so that's why we're 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 screaming to open opioid prevention centers. Um, there are two in New York. They've been there for two years. They've got all kinds of data. They haven't lost one person. Hmm. Um, an opioid prevention center is, is a, a place where somebody can go and use drugs in a clean, healthy, safe environment with caring, loving people, um, with health professionals. Um, these opioid prevention centers have showers and bathrooms and food and um, places that they can go, rooms that they can go and play cards in hang out and um, feel respected for the people that they are. But what's so important with all these, now there's a xylene zy drug that's out. It's a vet tranquilizer that they're putting now into the pills, uh, which gives you sores all over your body that don't go away. How is that spelled? Xylene? X-Y-L-Z-E. E N E, I think it is, and that's new. That's been that's that's been in the news now, probably about six months. But um, when they go into these places, you know, it helps take hepatitis C. You know, dirty needles, no more dirty needles. Um, you know, that cardio 
tinnitus that they get from their heart swelling from using um, all these things we we take away you know we we help them with um, at this meeting that I was at the other day there was a doctor that was there and this person she was in the hospital emergency room this person was asking for help he said I know I'm going to use today can anybody come with me and legally nobody could go with her and uh, they found them an hour and a half later in a bush right around the corner from the hospital and and she was crying sharing this story and that's why these centers need to open so that people have places to go to that they can use and a lot of people until they understand it they think we're just enabling them and that's not the case at all because there is also people there that um, are ready to take them into a detox or ready to take them in you know into treatment and they'll ask them is today the day but for us parents it's one more day they're alive parents that have lost or, or the parent that has a child going there it's one more day I would have driven my child there to have them one more day. Mm. And so these opioid prevention centers need to be need. There are two bills on the table right now, H1981, and I don't remember the second one, but they need to be looked up. They need to have um, people call your senators, your representatives, and see if they're on board with that. That's so important. And um, and sign on because it's going to be coming up again in September, and uh, and we'll be there at the state house and and we'll be there screaming and, and yelling because, you know, and, and the thing with this place too is is the states can't say, um, well, where's the funding coming from? Well, the funding is going to come from this opioid settlement money, so it's okay. It's not even taking away from them, you know. So, it's to me, it's a no brainer, but like everything else political it takes time you know um they pat it came out of committee back in february and i talked to one of the politicians and i said well then why isn't it why is it waiting till september to go back into committee again you know that's just how politics you know everything's slow this is shouldn't be slow this should it should have been done in march you know but so we just try to keep on it and keep doing what we can and keep trying to save lives because that's, you know, um, that's what we do. What, one of the things that uh, you have is a, uh, a mobile lab, a, a training room done up as a, as a bedroom uh, of, a, uh, of a teenager, young adult still living at home. And you use this as a way to be able to uh, visually educate the different ways that uh, drug use will be uh, maybe hidden or how mm -hmm. to find signs of drug use there. So hopefully uh, allowing an intervention before the addiction gets too strong. Wow. What was the name of this again? It's called Hope's Room. Hope's Room. That's right. It, and it's part of team sharing. It was a, a, a trailer that was donated to us through the Massachusetts Elks Association. And we, um, we've we taken this trailer and we've made it up into a mock bedroom. And Gary Carter and Tracy Carter take this trailer all over the Massachusetts. They've even gone down to Virginia with it. There's been requests out of state. Um, and we bring it to events that parents are gonna be at. Uh, we don't allow children in there because this would give them ideas, mm. you know, but we bring it to, you know, like parent teachers night at the schools, um, community events. And basically um, they walk into the trailer and Gary will give them a tour. He will show them the different places where they could stash drugs, like behind a wall plate, you know, your wall switch, who would know, you know, take two screws out and there's a bag of pills in there. And, um, you know, a lot of the stuff you can buy on Amazon. So things that look like water bottles actually have a screw at the bottom um, that you can take off and put the pills in there. So it, there's just 
it's all about education. We just don't stop education. Um, knowledge on, on the trailer, it says knowledge is power and power is hope. So as long as we have um, knowledge, there, there, there'll always be hope that they'll live another day. Uh, if someone wants to uh, uh, learn more about team sharing, uh, go to teamsharinginc.org. Inc.org, yep. Um, uh, everything, it... everything is on there, yep. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, any any final anything any final thoughts anything to share with the audience? To um, this has been so helpful. I'm so thankful you finally joined us and shared this information and your and your stories with us. There is one more thing. So we've been approved, say, seeing your license plates back there. So oh, yes, team sharing has been approved by the Registry of Motor Vehicles um, to have an overdose awareness license plate, which is really amazing. Um, but the, the, the law that's written in the way that it has to go is we need to get 750 prepaid applications before we can bring them to the registry of motor vehicles so they make us do the hard work up front so they don't even want to talk to us to see us or hear from us until we have 750 prepaid applications we we have um 415 right now so we need over a little over 300 uh, 340, 335. So we desperately need them. Um, if you go to our website too, there's a little video that you can watch on the license plate and you know why we do it in, in that. So I, I recommend you doing that. There's also the application on there. So once you uh, click on it, you just click on the application, fill it out, hit send, it comes right to me. So there's no you know handwriting paperwork or whatever. It costs $40 because it's a specialty plate. It's not a vanity plate. It's a specialty plate. It's a plate that can go on all cars. Um, it costs $40 every two years. So that comes down to about five cents a day, you know, and the whole object behind that is first of all, helping to end the stigma, but you see somebody with a license plate that says overdose awareness and you're driving down the road and you've got a child, maybe an active addiction, or maybe you've lost a child and you see that and you pull up beside that person in the parking lot and you just say, hey, I just realized that, you know, you have an overdose awareness license plate. How did that all come about? How do I, how would I get one? And, and a conversation starts. Hmm. You get the conversation starting and say, well, you know what? I, I lost a couple of kids to addiction and, um, you know, I'm supporting overdose awareness so that we can educate uh, the world. And, um, and this person might say, you know what, I lost a child and I've got nobody to talk to. Well, let me tell you about team sharing. Let me tell you where you can go to talk to somebody or, you know, maybe um, learn to cope. You know, maybe, maybe you need to go to a group if you've got a child in active addiction and you, you know, have you ever been to anything like that? Just, just basically conversations and start up the conversation and the more that's out there, it, it's taking a while to get that 750. But the more that's out there, the more conversation and the better it, better it is that we're going to end the stigma someday. And so, you know, I haven't met anybody that's not for it. I just, some people just don't want to give up the $40, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. But, but I, I, you know, if if your audience is interested, please go to our website and fill out an application. We would really appreciate it. And just to let you know, because it's a nonprofit, we had to be a nonprofit in order to do this. They just don't let anybody do this. That's why we were approved. Um, you know, that money, that money eventually goes back to team sharing and helps us fund these Christmas parties or pay for burials or buy urns or pay for groceries for a family that that can't afford it. All those things that we do. That's what that money is going to help. Uh, I know there are several audience members. Look into the camera. You know who you are. 
Uh, you can add a few more to that uh, that tally. I know uh, our family has we're in the queue. Yeah. And uh, come on, you don't you don't need to have had a loss. It's to support getting the uh, building the message, raising awareness, ending the stigma. Uh, there should not be an uncomfortable stigma uh, of talking about this subject or 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 other other social issues we need to uh, we need to be stronger than that and this is one of the most among those all the mo i have to delete that i'll just delete that i don't know how to say it <laughs> um okay well thank you very much cheryl um uh uh looking forward to uh, uh seeing you next time uh, uh we'll uh join you at the state house this august 31st um hopefully yes if you don't yes, mind if i have permission to be there uh i will be there okay awesome thank you sounds good thank you